So I'll hand it off to Daniel. Good morning. Thank you very much for asking me to chair this session. Uh, this is a session that's certainly near and dear to my heart. Um, I am very interested to hear what we're going to be hearing about in a few minutes. Dr. John Polovich and Howard Vincent are here to talk to us a bit about uh, telehealth and supporting uh, remote uh, communities. Uh, Dr. Polovich is a clinical associate professor in the Department of uh, Family Practice at UBC. Um, he has spent a, a career uh, supporting uh, remote uh, and distant communities, uh, particularly in the north, and uh, spends a lot of time on the road, actually visiting in person, but also utilizing uh, modern day technology to look after patients through telehealth um, using uh, technology, which he's going to talk to us about as well. Um, Howard Vinson is an individual who's had the opportunity to receive care uh, through just these type of programs. So um, it's a real uh, opportunity to see both sides of uh, this uh, care model. So thanks very much. All right, uh, oh, I guess I'm mic'd up. So thank you so much. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here today. Howard and I are, are grateful for the opportunity to come to um, talk a little bit about um, telehealth and how it incorporates into chronic kidney disease. Um, you can see my first slide. Uh, by the way, does anybody know what today is? It's International Smile Day. So. Uh, <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, so you should turn to the left and the right and smile at each other. So um, by the end of this short talk, you should be feeling much better, okay? Because this is probably the least sophisticated talk you're going to hear in two days. So, um, but we hope it's the most emotionally uh, powerful and enriched for you. So when all of us are thinking about this is a kidney forum, and you guys are all have specialties around kidney disease. But I'm a generalist. I'm a family doctor, and um, I deal with a whole bunch of stuff. Pregnant moms, elders, people that are dying, people that are being born, um, people in between. And, and chronic kidney disease is part of the spectrum of chronic disease. And um, we need to start thinking about the holistic uh, patient, and that there are there's a patient attached to the kidneys, and that patient often has um, other chronic health issues. Would it be better if I used the other mic? Yeah, the Sorry? Podium mic. Okay, I'll use that. So, here's my declarations. Um, quickly, I work with everyone. I don't have any financial interest with anyone other than my wife and my financial advisor. And these are the communities um, that, I, that I work with closely, Fort Babine, Tatchet, Yakuchi, Stilaco, and Takla Landing, a whole bunch of people, uh, some of which are in the room today. David Anderson, who's uh, from FNHA, who's helping us here today, um, standing at the back. Thank you so much. Um, these people make it possible for me to do what I do uh, in the places I do it. Um, I'm also the director of the Rural Education Action Plan for uh, BC, for rural physicians. And I have two kids, and I have the best wife that also is the, the real reason that I can speak here today. These are my partners, uh, and uh, the whole bunch. Um, and truth, truthfully, um, I interact with all these all these groups and people from them uh, to push forward uh, a new system of care for patients like Howard and uh, and pe other people in the communities um, that we travel to. And I'm also a, have a partnership with BC Renal Agency, um, and I help. Um, try to forward care uh, of kidney disease in these rural and remote places by working with the BC Renal Agency. So here's, here's my opening thought. Um, it's much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has. And my job is to look holistically at patients who have chronic disease. We all know that um, the next 30, 40 years, um, is, going, is currently bringing us, but it's only going to bring more chronic disease. That's our challenge. And kidney, chronic kidney disease simply represents um, a spectrum of chronic disease, and, and it's overwhelming us now. And we have a historical system of health care. And so this talks a little bit about what we could do differently. My job is um, I'm privileged to be able to work in rural and remote BC, and I have for the last 20 years. I live in Abbotsford now uh, from 2011, but 
um, the first 15 years of my career uh, with my wife, who's also a family physician, has, has uh, given us the opportunity to travel and live in rural and remote BC. And British Columbia is very diverse. It's interesting geographically, culturally, um, but it creates challenges for care. And Howard drove, um, he told me today, uh, it takes about 14 hours to drive from Tatchet if you just stop for a, a pee break and fill up your, your, your car with fuel. So 14 hours. A lot of times people just can't get um, to a neighboring community to see a physician for various reasons. And some of the communities are so um, remote um, and tucked away on the edge of a lake or a river in a valley on, on, the, on a central coast or what have you. It's very, very, very challenging for people to access care. Why do we care? Well, um, if we, this is part of the reason why I do what I do now, but there's, we have a, sh a shameful history in Canada of, of uh, discrepancy of life of living, and um, people of Aboriginal descent um, don't do so well in Canada. And in fact, um, when we look at through the spectrum of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, uh, on the right the, um, is the kind of um, standard uh, non-Indigenous population, and then there are the other groups. And you can see males and females, um, the Inuit fare the worst, um, but in general, um, there's an unacceptable gap in life expectancy in Canada between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. If you go to places like Australia, the, the discrepancy only is magnified. So that's pretty. That's not acceptable. I, I don't think anybody in the room here would would agree that that's that's an acceptable gap. And we know that chronic disease, because um, about the talk, is super prevalent in First Nations communities. Um, this is a study out of Victoria. So, uh, so the evidence is clear. Um, there's a need. There's an isolated population, and a lot of the story we're telling today, I think, is translatable into more urban areas. So that's what I want you to think about. Everybody remembers this 1984 document, uh, Canada Health Act, and uh, something about access is one of the, the tenets of the Canada Health Act, and having reasonable access to health care, primary care, specialty care. Um, it, does, it doesn't hold true for these communities that, we're, that I'm showing you today. So we've, we have a, a major gap in just accessing the service. And remember, without access, there's no care, there's no quality, there's nothing to measure. So what are we going to do? And, and not only access, but timely access is another problem. So as Jerry Garcia said, somebody has to do something. We have an antiquated uh, model of care. It's a post-war um, system, you know, that came along 60 years ago, and uh, it wasn't designed to handle chronic disease, isolated populations, and so forth. So, what is wrong with the system? We could probably spend the next day talking about um, why it doesn't work well. But let me just give you some some of my feelings. It's not patient-centered. It's system and doctor and nurse centered. It's not patient centered. What does patient centered mean? Well, providing care that's respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that the patient, patient values guide all clinical decisions. So I would challenge everyone in the room here today to think about that. And when we're dealing with patients with chronic kidney disease, are we really putting the patient at the center of, of our strategy to manage our chronic disease? Do we really need to funnel all the patients into acute care centers and doctor's offices? Is that really patient-centered care? So this is a story about merging different systems. This is a picture of um, a conventional on the ground, that's what everybody understands. That's me in the community in Fort Babine. And then there's me showing up on a TV screen uh, on a video telehealth cart, which you'll see in a bit. Um, and those are two different, complete different systems of healthcare delivery. And yet they're amazingly complementary. And they're predicated and founded on strong relationships 
okay? So relationships are the backbone of everything I do, and I, arguably it's the fundamental key ingredient to success in everyone's work. Um, but it really allows for virtual healthcare to be safe and effective and successful. So by going to communities and, and smelling and touching and sharing food and stories and examining and practicing medicine uh, allows me to conduct telehealth or healthcare over a virtual medium much more successfully. People know each other. And this also has the value of um, creating longitudinal access to care. So where places like Howard lives, the historical model that still exists in most places in the world, but certainly in Canada, are physicians fly in, they fly out, they drive in, they drive out, they boat in, they boat out. They parachute into a community, they spend time there, they run a clinic, and they disappear. And for the next 30 days, the community is left without uh, a physician, sometimes a, a nurse, an itinerant nurse. And what do you do for those, the gaps of time in between? So now we have the ability for, I see patients on a Friday and I follow them up the following Tuesday. Um, patients uh, wake up with a child who doesn't isn't feeling well and we can connect and, and deal with those problems um, right away. So we, we merge uh, systems. We use technology. This is uh, on one end. This is just to give you an example of different kinds of technology. There's a video conferencing unit, um, the big unit on my desk in my uh, telehealth office. And we're going we're gonna to see how this looks uh, in real time here at the end of this talk. Um, we also have laptops and smartphones and tablets. Um, pretty much we live in an era where anything is possible in terms of connecting virtually. And if you think that I'm kind of out to lunch um, about technology, um, I'll just remind you that the average 14 or 15-year-old child, teenager, texts about 4,000 times per month on average. So the new normal is uh, they feel much more comfortable on these gadgets than coming to sit in a room like we're doing right now. Their world is virtual. And so those, for, those teenagers are becoming adults very shortly. And, um, and I, would, I would challenge everyone in this room who, who survives without a cell phone, without texting, impossible, all right? So that's just the reality of our world. And... On the other end of things, in, the, in a remote community, uh, we have sophisticated telehealth carts. This is a mobile cart um, that can Wi-Fi driven, that can move around a health center, that can help with an acute patient, with a not so acute patient, which has some cameras attached so I can look in ears. Yesterday I had helping a nurse look in someone's ear and diagnosing problems in throats. We have stethoscopes. We can listen to hearts. Um, you can, the, the array of what we call peripherals or th devices that connect to these video units are amazing. We're looking at ultrasound and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, remember getting back to my theme of my talk is putting patients at the center. And uh, does the chap look familiar? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> the hair color is a little different. Uh, but other than that, striking resemblance. Remember, so putting, we're going to hear a little bit from Howard about what that means from his perspective, because it really doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the patient thinks. I just want to touch on this briefly, shared care. So shared care, everybody may understand. It's kind of the flavor of the day in, in healthcare, uh, primary care and specialists uh, getting together to discuss a patient, to collaborate. Imagine that, collaboration between healthcare providers. Um, but this is collaboration in a different way. This is in real time. So I was taught when I wanted to refer a patient to Dr. Gill that I would see my patient, go into my office, write a story, put it in an envelope, mail it. It would show up in Dr. Gill's office. He would open it, read it, book an appointment for the patient. Uh, three months later, patient would travel to his office, sit in the waiting room for extended period of time, go into his office, have a visit. Dr. Gill would dictate a letter, put it in an envelope, and it would go into the mail, and it would come back to me, and then I would open it and read it, and 
hopefully I had the questions answered that I really wanted. So does that sound kind of not so contemporary? <laughs> I would say it, it is. So what does shared care do that, that historical, conventional ways of, of uh, seeing patients from a consultant standpoint, but also from a primary care standpoint, uh, how does it differ? Well, um, virtual medicine allows very seamlessly the ability to connect three, four, five people. I've, d I've done WebEx uh, meetings where a patient, a consultant, myself, we all meet at 8.30, we discuss everything. Most importantly, the patient's present, uh, I'm present, consultant's present, we deal with the issues, and we all say bye and we make another time to meet. Uh, that kind of immediacy, that kind of um, ability to, to communicate all together, to collaborate on a, on a plan, I would argue, is where we need to go. And it should be the norm, it shouldn't be the exception. So cutting to the chase again with kidney disease, this is the perfect marriage. We've talked about this, Howard and I have, uh, and others. Chronic kidney disease is, is, this is a slam dunk. I mean, chronic kidney disease is not uh, an acute abdomen uh, for the most part. This is about managing something over time, and uh, there's a lot of numbers involved, and it's micromanaging medicines and making sure people are on the right path and eating properly and exercising and you know doing, doing lifestyle things, following up for appointments and so forth. Do people really need to travel long distances to, to have this information? So it's not that you never need to travel, but probably a lot less than what people do. We could, man we could meet people in their homes. I'm showing you something today in the health center, but the future is gonna be doctors just connecting to patients where they are, in their homes or at work or what have you. And man, how are things going? We know the blood pressure is much more accurate taken outside the office than in the office, so we can get a lot of information uh, from patients. And with remote sensors and other things now, um, the need for patients to travel into hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities is lessening. And this is a solution for both rural and urban um, patients. So I'm giving you the story of um, a rural and remote perspective, but really this is translatable into an ur urban environment. So I'm going to, um, to leave us some time. I just want to emphasize a few points, and then I'm going to let Howard take over, and then we're going to, we have a special guest, uh, Ms. Gloria Michelle, who's in Tachet, which is on Babine Lake, which is at the end of the road. Anybody know what the significance of Babine Lake is? Who's been to Babine Lake? We have one person. So Babine Lake's the longest natural lake in British Columbia. It's home to Lake Babine Nation, which the community of Tachet is one of the communities. Um, it's, it's a very remote, isolated community, and I think it's, we're, gonna, we're very privileged to be able to connect in there today. But we need to re hit the reset button in healthcare in, in Canada and, and around uh, internationally, uh, for that matter. We, we have a crisis of chronic disease uh, upon us, and it's only going to be magnified in the, in the years ahead. And we, we can't limp into the future with a historical system. We need to think about putting patients truly at the center of our, of our care plans, and uh, we haven't done that, and uh, I, I think it's undeniable that we have not done that, and we can do a lot better. Uh, technology is just a tool to help facilitate um, patient-centered care. It's one, one tool. I mean, there are many facets of technology, but in the journey towards a, a patient-centered approach, Technology can be um, the friend of the patient and the provider and really allow and bring people together to communicate uh, in, a, in a much more holistic and, um, and positive way. So I'm going to turn things over to Howard and then we're going to do a little live demo and then we're going to answer some questions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, nervous as hell, but I thought that uh, last night while I was tossing in my bed and uh, you know sleepless and worried about today, 
that I was going to walk into a room of uh, everybody dressed up in suit and ties. And that, so my response was going to be, so you you all are dress code challenged. <laughs> but that, thank God you guys are somewhat normal. <laughs> so I'm here to speak um, from a patient's perspective. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Burrard, Squamish, and uh, Musqueam nations for being on their traditional territory uh, for, in order for us to do this work, so appreciate that. Um, telehealth. We in Lake Babby Nation agreed to do this because it had been two years we were trying to train Dr. John in how to s send smoke signals. And he wasn't getting the complexity of the shapes and the fire and wind judgment and all of that. So, you know, uh, we didn't want any of our brothers and sisters dying, so we agreed to what he's suggesting. So that's the story behind that. If he tells you anything different, no. Um, I live with uh, a number of uh, situations. Uh, chronic kidney disease is one, uh, hep C, uh, diabetes, complex uh, post-traumatic stress, depression, um, uh, but I'm still here, <laughs> amazingly. So the benefit of, uh, of telehealth is, is the care is more immediate. And for some people, especially the older people on reserves, some of them have, uh, are survivors of residential school, and some of them find it very hard to sit in a room with another person, especially if, that, if it involves touch. So this way, uh, there's a buffer zone. There's a, a reality, but not a reality. And uh, so you can talk about what's going on for you, um, and, and not have these anxieties swell up and, uh, and what they would normally do if, it was, if this was the style of healthcare is they wouldn't come until it was, you know, until they're almost dead. So this brings people in and it makes them feel safe and it, they get their answers. Uh, it, it's immediate because uh, where I live, yeah, there's a, um, an ambulance in town, but if that ambulance is taken up by a call, you're lucky if you get one in an hour. Um, Fort Babin, which is another community I work in, uh, is an hour and a half away on a dirt logging road. So. And an ambulance, you're lucky, two hours from Smithers. And what people have to do usually is rent a, rent a ride because not everybody has a vehicle. Uh, so they have to rent somebody, pay somebody, take their, their loved one towards uh, Smithers. Now when, uh, you know, and most, most of the people receive $235 per month to live on. And if you got to pay $80 to get your loved one to a hospital. So there's a nurse in, the, in Fort Babine and uh, you know, if there's a crisis situation, go bang on their door and uh, um, access the health clinic and, and start dialing up Dr. John and hopefully he's not sleeping or otherwise preoccupied and get him on the line. Um, the other thing is, is that for me, uh, you know, I, I just thought those, those conditions were just, you know, conditions. That's, they don't get serious, they don't, um, they don't you know, they, they may progress, but and why should I take care of them? And uh, through telehealth um, and in person, I've discovered the severity of 
chronic kidney disease. And uh, one of the ways, uh, one of the remarkable ways was that uh, Dr. John got me on telehealth and uh, he says, I got some numbers for you. You know, I've heard these numbers before. This number, that number, what do they mean? So he puts the, the paper with the numbers on it up on the screen and says, you see this number? I said, yeah, this is what it means. So I'm getting a classroom education. You know, that, that's benefiting me. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that he does that with his other clients. So they get, you know, and sitting in a, in a clinic, waiting an hour to see a doctor, and you're in and out in five minutes, you don't get the same treatment. And, and the nearest clinic is in Burns Lake an hour away. Again, you got to rent, you know, rent somebody to take you in. Two hundred thirty-five dollars. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, I'll highlight an example that uh, Dr. John and I worked together uh, in Tatchet. We had a suicide kid, and we managed to catch him just before his chosen time. And uh, Dr. John and I both worked with him. And when I was out of the community, Dr. John would contact him and, and help him out for that day. So if you have a doctor in Burns Lake, are you going to get the same kind of treatment? You're going to get the same kind of care? There's a guy alive today because of this. There's a human being who's going to make a difference in life who is alive today because of this. Think about that. You know, we just happened to be there. And then we had this to help us. And for most First Nations, how we get to know people, you know, we don't sit in the, sorry, light. Um, we don't sit in a little room and uh, ask a bunch of questions. You know, how are you, where you come from, and all that stuff. Why is your hair orange, and, you know. <laughs> you know, and the ladies would say, how come you're so handsome? <laughs> um, so, for First Nations, how we get to know somebody is we'll hang out with them. Not a word is spoken. You read what he does in situations. You sense his energy. You see where he laughs. You see where he withdraws. And you have a complete understanding of who that person is. And telehealth is, is kind of that way, too. Because, you know, the, 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 the people who don't want to come in, all of a sudden they're coming in. There's a significant rise in, in participation in, in the healthcare in Tachet. And I believe it's due to telehealth. Because the old people are, aren't afraid to come in now. Um, and they, they're usually, if they need to talk to Dr. John, they come to the reception and talk to Gloria. Gloria contacts Dr. John. Within an hour, we're dealing with it. Previously, before to Dr. John, I had a doctor in Burns Lake. He only came to Burns Lake every two weeks. So oftentimes, I would have to wait a, a month for an appointment to get my test results, to get, you know, uh, medication and all, all of that stuff. Uh, I can get it within, within hours. So even though Dr. John uh, is failed at the smoke signals uh, <laughs> class, we, we, we really love him up north. 
And uh, he's not afraid to mingle in with the people. And, and again, it's a way of connecting and getting to know the people where on the ground they live. Right? You don't get that in, in, in an office. You see all these diplomas, you see all this and this and this, right? Prescription pads, holy shit, man. You know? How do you feel connected? How can you feel, not criticizing, but I'm just saying, how do you feel connected with that? You know, First Nations, we're, we're, we like connections. We believe we're all connected, right? So when there's material obstacles, we can't feel connected. And if we can't feel connected with, with the environment, then we can't feel connected with the people in, in the environment, and we can't feel connected enough to say, well, this is what's wrong with me. Because sometimes, Patients won't tell you directly. They'll tell you a story. And you have to listen. And uh, so it's counting down seven, six, <laughs> five. So thank you very much. So I'd love to invite people to uh, ask some questions. There's microphones at the side. If you could go there so the rest of the room could hear you. Um, while, oh, we have one right there, perfect. Yeah, good morning. Um, thank you both, and Howard, thanks for the personal nature of the stories. My question's really directed more towards Howard. Um, for uh, if, let's say, specialty care was needed, let's say Dr. Pavlovich needed some assistance, whether it's with um, you know, kidney or one of your other chronic disease management, how would you feel or um, your people feel about engaging in a telehealth system with someone you don't know? You know, you've spoken about the personal relationships you have with him. That's wonderful. That's so clear. But for someone, you know, one of us in this room, if you were to engage across the screen, how, how would you feel about that? Well, I think part of the answer comes from the word that you used, engaged. We're already engaged with, with Dr. John and uh, a trust and uh, a commonality, a community sense has been built. So if he says that, you know, I'm gonna bring so-and-so on, would you mind? And if it's gonna benefit my health, and that's what Dr. John is telling me, it's not a problem. And I find that a lot of First Nations are, are in, in agreement to, to further consultation. Because, again, they're, built, they're beginning to trust the system. It's there for them. And they don't have to travel. Usually people got sent away to Vancouver for tests and go see somebody. But, you know, again, you know, the $235, right? And they don't pay much for patient travel. So it's right there. There's trust being built. Um, this is friendlier than going to meet strangers again. And um, coming to Vancouver for some people is still cultural shock. So it's, it's uh, I think we're all in, in agreement for, if our doctor tells us that it's gonna improve our health. Does that answer your question? Very much, thank you. Thank you. While we're waiting for the next question, I might just ask something to you, John. Um, if the renal community wanted to get started to do this and, pro and provide um, this type of support, um, how hard, or perhaps better said, how easy is it for us to get started? Yeah, great question. I think the easiest answer for this audience is linking up with your respective health authority IT people. Um, certainly if you're in a hospital setting uh, or health authority facility, uh, that's going to be necessary and uh, the IT folks I know from all the respective health authorities have, a, have a, a very ambitious strategy to get doctors doing this stuff. Um, so that's one avenue. Then there's the um, connecting to through your private office, um, office setting and there are different platforms people can use. Telus is coming out with some stuff. There are companies like Medio. 
um, where we're using some other um, technology through WebEx and so forth. So there are, there are different tools to get the job done, but uh, the, probably the first step, if you're health authority based in any way, is connect with your IT team um, because there'll be a telehealth lead person for every health authority. I had another question. Um, this one for Dr. Palovich. Um, we sort of alluded to this yesterday with the Northern Health. It's great to see all these resources coming up, but there may be communities that perhaps don't have a telehealth setup, may still need to commute to get to a telehealth setup. What's to stop us from doing simply FaceTime from our office to someone in their home? Great question. So what if you don't have a telehealth setup like we do? Um, what if there's nothing else? Well, I can tell you that in my work, um, not everybody has a telehealth setup. And so in the spirit of patient-centered care, I use what tool I need to use. So Skype is, is used internationally to provide health care. So if you go to Brazil, people, doctors uh, will connect to people in, in the Amazon through Skype. Uh, in other jurisdictions, they'll use that. Does Skype meet the regulatory benchmarks in British Columbia? No. Is it better to connect to somebody in their home community and help them uh, than not? And can I just say, no, I'm, I, I'm not going to help you because I just don't have the tool to do it. I'm not going to do that. So I use the tools that I use um, to help the patient where they are. So sometimes I have to use Skype, sometimes I have to use FaceTime, and most of the time I'm using very formal systems like this. As we go through, as, as this journey continues, though, we're making progress. We're continually improving uh, and creating Skype-like uh, platforms that are secure and so forth. So to answer your question, I use what I got to use to help the patient, uh, understanding that uh, in the future there'll be something better. But let me just remind everybody, who uses one of these? Come on. Everybody does. How secure is your cell phone? It is the common denominator when it comes to technology and communication with all healthcare providers and patients. We use it every single day. In fact, the system would absolutely implode if, you, if we took cell phones away. It is not secure. Okay? So uh, just remember that when you're getting overly um, overthinking security and so forth. You have to be mindful of these things. But the patient is most important. And I'm not saying being reckless. I'm saying being uh, judicious in what we do. And does this make sense? If I don't do this, what's, is the other strategy better? So use the technology that helps the patient that makes sense and, and do it safely. Um, Dear Eleven, who I don't know if she's here today, she always um, likes to, this, this quote, uh, Perfect is the enemy of good. And I, I, I kind of take that to heart every day. And in, te in, in, I, in the IT world, in telehealth, perfect is definitely the enemy of good, okay? If you're waiting for the perfect system, then you're not going to get engaged. It doesn't exist, okay? So you, we need to be mindful and thoughtful and careful uh, and safe. But sometimes we just have to use tools that aren't perfect yet. One last question, then. Um, this one's about, I guess, the relationship. So was the success of the project also due to the fact that you built the relationships before you started doing the telehealth? And can you talk a little bit more about how you um, worked with, maybe it's also with Howard, how you, you built those relationships and the trust so that the people of the, the band would participate? So having relationships with people definitely makes doing telehealth uh, more successful and easier for everyone. And those relationships were founded on spending time in communities with, with patients. Um, having said that, is it possible to develop relationships when you never met somebody? Uh, I've had patients who I've never met who I've done, you know, medical visits over telehealth who told me that there was the best doctor-patient visit they have ever had in their life. Now, that's pretty sad, but uh, it's the truth. But um, I guess what I'm saying is we think 
that we have to do it a certain way, how, you know, develop relationships on the ground. Uh, getting back to my point about 14-year-olds, I'm guessing they would think things are a little different because their relationships are driven by technology. They're virtual ones. Um, in fact, they spend far more time doing texting than they do meeting in person. So we have a new generation of people coming up who are going to teach us something different about relationships and how to, how to nurture those relationships and develop those relationships. So to answer your question, yes, I've, time on the ground builds relationships, but technology keeps advancing those relationships, and that's what creates the success. Okay, thank you.